Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our uh, first roundtable of the conference, which deals with regional security. Uh, and we have, uh, through our terrific cooperation with the George C. Marshall Center in garmisch partenkirchen a well-developed uh, panel of specialists who hail from four different countries to talk about regional security. Uh, our panelists hail from the United Kingdom, from the US, uh, from Hungary and, of course, from Poland, because particularly at this conference, no panel would be complete without at least one Polish representative. So uh, we're happy that uh, we can listen to what will be, I'm sure, a very, very good presentation and discussion, uh, which, of course, we will invite you to ask questions uh, of our uh, specialists uh, after they're finished. So. Uh, let me find the right page so I can say a few words about our panelists, and then we'll begin our discussion. <coughs> and 
and here we are. Uh, the representative uh, of the Marshall Center with whom I've been uh, communicating uh, before this meeting so that this uh, conference would become the raging success that it is, uh, is Matthew Rhodes, uh, who is sitting here in, in the middle. Uh, he's a professor of national security studies at the Marshall Center. Uh, he's been at a number of other institutions as well. And uh, his interests are US foreign and security policy, transatlantic relations, and Central and Southeast European security issues, which suits us to a T. Uh, Graham Hurd is sitting to my right. Uh, he's a professor of transnational security studies also at the Marshall Center uh, and the founding director of the School of Government and associate dean in the faculty of business, Plymouth University. Uh, he was a founder of the Center for Sea Power and Strategy at the Britannia Royal Naval Academy in Dartmouth and he will be our first speaker. Uh, Paul Dunai is sitting next uh, to uh, Matthew Rhodes. Uh, he's a professor of NATO and European security issues at the Marshall Center. Uh, he's worked at the Stockholm uh, International Peace Research Institute. Uh, he reopened and directed the Hungarian Institute of International Affairs and was director of the Organization for Security Operation Cooperation in Europe's Academy in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyzstan. He's been around the block. Uh, and he's a specialist on European security and East Central Europe and Eastern Europe and Central Asia, the OSCE, and the legality of the use of force. Uh, our last speaker uh, is uh, from Krakow, uh, where he received his PhD and became a professor in the Middle and Far East Studies Institute, Department of Political and International Studies of the Jagiellonian University. And so he would fit in another panel very nicely. We have room for you if, if you're available. Uh, he has a long and distinguished career in uh, the administration in Poland. He served on a number of uh, special units of various ministries. Um, he has a great deal of experience in security studies. Uh, and of course, he's a great specialist on the new security doctrine that uh, Poland uh, just published and just became public uh, two weeks ago. Since 2016, he's the Deputy Director of the Military Foreign Affairs Department and advisor of the uh, ministry, Minister of National Defense and is his plenipotentiary for the strategic defense review that I mentioned. So he knows what the Polish uh, armed forces are uh, about. Uh, I'd like to ask Graham to begin our discussion, and uh, if you could hold your remarks to about 12 minutes, that would be good. Well, thank you, John. Uh, I'm delighted to be in Warsaw uh, on this panel. Um, when I first graduated uh, with a PhD and had my first academic post, the first international conference I went to was in Wroclaw, and I obviously had to travel through Warsaw, so it's really nice to be back. And, uh, I hope the paper I give now is much better than the paper I, I gave in Wroclaw when I was young and dangerously good looking, <coughs> as I like to think of myself. Okay, so I'm going to try and look at uh, how do we understand uh, the rationality, the logic of Russia's foreign policy, particularly destabilization efforts, and how sustainable is this? Uh, is it something that, uh, that's been going on but will uh, gradually diminish, or is it set to stay as it is or even increase? Those are the, the key questions I'm looking at. Um, to try and understand uh, Russian's foreign policy, I think we need to look into the domestic, uh, economic, political, social system that's been created by a system-forming figure, that is President Putin. And the two key uh, data points here really are, are two strategic vulnerabilities that Russia has to deal with. The first is the hydrocarbon dependence, 50% of uh, exports, um, or 50% of, sorry, GDP, 70% of exports, 98% of corporation tax. The vulnerability is that Russia cannot affect the price of oil globally. So if oil's at 110 or oil's at $25, Russia can't do anything about that price, and that is a vulnerability. Second vulnerability is the popularity of the president. When Putin has demodernized Russia, deinstitutionalized, and deglobalized Russia, um, it means that if his popularity decreases, then you have a kind of existential crisis within the Federation. If not Putin, who? There's no contingency plans, no succession mechanism. 
uh, to replace the leader. So essentially, we're looking at Russia's foreign policy operating in a context where the economy is here in the toilet, basically, 0.2% uh, average GDP growth since 2009, 2012 zero growth, and since 2012, it's gone down. This is when Kudrin resigned from the government. So the economy is here, and the popularity of the president is here. This is a very abnormal uh, context. Normally, the popularity of a president, as happened in the first eight years of Putin's uh, presidency from 2000 to 2008, tracks the economy, maybe lags a little bit behind. As the economy increases, so the popularity. So this is very um, abnormal politics. But within this context, destabilization uh, makes a lot of sense. It's uh, a policy for a weak economy, a foreign policy for a weak economy, a foreign policy for the high popularity of the president. And it's a foreign policy which uh, is cheap and gives you a very good return on investment. So it works, in other words. And to understand really strategically, I think, what Russia's doing, it's interesting to look at von Clausewitz uh, and his book, On War. Clausewitz, as we know, is a, was an officer in Russian and Prussian military service. And he introduces the concept of a Schwerpunkt, or center of gravity. And if you think of the center of gravity of Russia in lieu of an economy that functions and political system, the center of gravity in Russia is the belief of the people in the necessity of a strong leader who can patrol the frontier, uh, guard the besieged fortress against external enemies, the good czar you know, who holds the line, while the bad boyers, the government, muck up the economy. So the necessity of a strong leader, destabilization, must be able to defend and advance that notion. And secondly, if you look at center of gravity attack or offense center of gravity, we're looking at Russia destabilizing market democratic systems and states and their center of gravity, which again is an intangible center of gravity. It's not a building or a monument. It's a belief, the belief in uh, the integrity, for example, of democratic election systems, of solidarity, of democratic values, transparency, accountability, et cetera, et cetera. So when we look at Russia's use of conventional and subconventional tools, conventional tools being the presidency, presidential administration, state-controlled economy and companies, um, state-controlled civil society, the diplomatic corps, the intelligence services, the media, etc. When we look at Russia's foreign policy, we see all of these act actors having a role and function in attacking the center of gravity of the West, the political West, but defending Russia's center of gravity. And we see intelligence services acting as a linchpin to subconventional actors that Russia can use. Support to and from anti-status quo parties, for example, in Europe. Uh, weaponizing history and identity, the use of frozen conflicts, weaponizing migrants and refugees, the use of transnational organized criminal groups, uh, corruption the kind of Kremlin's playbook, uh, the CSIS study captures some of this very well in five states uh, in the region. Uh, and also the use of strategic proxy forces, such as Ultras or Kadyrovsky or private military corporations, Moran Group, RBS Group in Libya, Wagner Group in Syria, for example, or the Balkan Cossack Army, so-called, that ran the coup last year in Montenegro, or a Baltic civil army, so-called, in the Baltic states. So there's many examples you can look at of these particular uh, subconventional strategic proxy forces. And essentially, you have a foreign policy then that uh, is deniable, or the destabilization elements are deniable. It washes its face, so to speak, to use an English expression. It pays for itself if you're using the operation also to have money laundering uh, going on. And it's the evidence, I think, of the utility of this foreign policy you see in state discourse. If you listen to uh, Sergei Lavrov or, or President Putin uh, or some of the propagandists in the Senate and the Parliament, the Duma, State Duma of Russia, you basically see two types of narratives or discourses. One leads or buttresses this idea of center of gravity defense and one center of gravity attack. So for example, you often hear the, the expression, things may be bad in Russia, but they're worse in the West. 
you know, uh, go to Berlin and you'll be raped, as the Lisa case propaganda tried to demonstrate. Uh, this is one um, part of the discourse. The idea that um, Russia's a great power. To sacrifice is to be a great power. We need to sacrifice more if we're to rise from our knees. That they fear us for our greatness. They're scared of and therefore try and harm us because we are great. This is the kind of internal, uh, we're a besieged fortress, we're under threat. It's your duty, your patriotic duty, to have military patriotic mobilization around uh, Alexander Nevsky, who is in fact President Putin. This is the tradition that's being played upon. And in foreign policy terms, or externally, the center of gravity attack, uh, Lavrov often says, there can be no European security without Russia. In other words, if you don't give us Yalta Potsdam II, or Helsinki III, a grand bargain, a sphere of privileged interest, we'll take it through destabilization. Power is relative. If Russia is unable or unwilling to do structural economic reform and strengthen itself, then it can, it can as an equalizer, uh, weaken the West. And this is a form of, of parity equality. And also, more, more recently, you have the notion of a Moscow consensus or neo-modernism in Russian thinking. In other words, it's not just a critique of the West, but they're now advancing an alternative market democratic paradigm, governance paradigm. And this, I think, comes hopefully after eight minutes or so to the last four minutes of my presentation, which will look at um, how sustainable, then, is this model. Integrated chain of command, uh, conventional, subconventional actors to destabilize the West and at the same time stabilize Russia. This is, this is what we're saying. So how, how, how far can this go on? Well, there's really three alternative futures, I think, that are out there that we can analyze. The first is that Russia now is about to or is in the process of doing a strategic pivot. Kiss and make up with the West. Uh, a Trump-Putin summit that uh, allows for peaceful coexistence and selective detente with the West. Uh, that Russia needs to do this to get capital and technology from the West to exploit, for example, the Arctic. I think there are a number of reasons why this isn't likely to happen. Firstly, the role of anti-Americanism, again, where you have no politics or economy, in holding the system together, in center of gravity defense in Russia. If you're a besieged fortress, you need a dignified enemy, and Merkel does not equal Trump. So anti-Americanism is kind of hardwired, I think, into the system. Uh, secondly, at least amongst Trump's national security elite, there's no misunderstanding and misperception and sense that if only we could talk, we could overcome these misunderstandings and misperception. There, there's a high degree of uh, realism, I think, in the fact that uh, Russians lie, Russian interlocutors lie, and cannot be trusted. And we'll see with the ceasefire in southern Syria you know, how long that lasts. And we'll see also, can Putin resist the urge to try and drive a wedge between Trump's national security elite, so-called deep state, and Trump himself? I don't think they can. Leaking the Kislyuk uh, Lavrov pictures from the White House, for example, was uh, self-sabotage as far as I can see, but underscores Russia's need to have victories, tactical victories, even at the expense of, of strategic uh, having better relations. You also have LNG exports, US coming from energy interdependence, hemispherically to energy independent, to beginning to export. And Trump's also talked about a, an arms race. So you end up with uh, Putin looking at 1986, where you had these conditions, but without perestroika, or without a plan B, essentially, which would be structural economic reform, which in his view leads to the end of the uh, uh, change and reform would lead to the collapse of the system. Or if it was successful, essentially regime or leadership change. So he's not going to do that. The second option is kind of big bang revolution. 2017 is 1917 that the system's overloaded, the system's militarizing, uh, resources are diminishing, there's a Czechistocracy, Czechists or Siloviki are fighting each other, cannibalizing each other. Uh, manual control isn't working as well as it used to work. So this is a thesis put forward by Nikolai Petrov at the Higher School of Economics. And I think there's a number of reasons why this isn't going to happen. Society is acclimatizing. The elite have no option but Putin. There is no consensus or mechanism to get a consensus around an alternative to Putin. And the middle class have a lot to lose. And 
200,000 of them can emigrate each year, and this acts as a safety valve. The system is much more adaptable than this thesis would suggest. There's still money in the system. So where does that leave us? It leaves us with the last option, and the option, I think, is most likely. And that is a kind of long goodbye scenario, where you have stability plateaus and then mini crises. You have zastoy stagnation, gradual degradation. Uh, I think, actually, Russia's crossed the critical threshold where they're hardwired or locked into this trajectory. And then if you start to look at some of the characteristics of that particular system, uh, think of Democratic People's Republic of Korea, a uh, DPRK-type uh, outcome. This is a state in which organized crime is used and mainstreamed into the foreign policy to break sanctions. This is a state in which nuclear signaling occurs, and Putin's under pressure to demonstrate the political utility of these expensive weapon systems. It's a military-first approach. Uh, you know, guns ahead of butter. Bread uh, takes a second role to battleships. Uh, it's otaki or chuche in the North Korean uh, understanding. That self-sufficiency, and this is something Ragozin and the nationalists are talking a lot about. And it's essentially a G0 world order. It's a spoiler role in international affairs to act as an equalizer. And in this situation, I think, uh, the risks of miscalculation, misperception, uh, conflict escalation ladders increase. And Russia still has force multipliers it can use. Um, the speed of the decision making, for example, the geographical proximity it has to hotspots, uh, regional hotspots or local hotspots, the military tactical ability uh, and ability to uh, exploit weaknesses that are there in um, states around Russia. The return on investment, as the economy shrinks, the return on investment increases. Uh, the strength of the belief in the center of gravity that state control of television is able to maintain. And the political will of a leader who knows he has no other option, essentially. And lastly, Western acquiescence. Uh, Western weakness in policy responses. And I think this is something that uh, Matt will talk a little about when he looks at NATO's response. So I think the destabilization effort's here to stay, and it'll only increase. I'd be very happy to take any questions on that. Thank you. OK, thanks. Uh, I think that it should be a, a smooth transition. Uh, we've heard, I think, a good overview of the kind of challenge or threat that Russia has presented to the Euro-Atlantic community. Uh, I'll try to talk a little bit about what NATO in particular, uh, as a core part of that community, has been doing to respond. Uh, we heard a little bit about this from Ambassador Birja this morning, and I'll try to, uh, to fill in some additional areas. Uh, first, maybe a, a starting point is to, to recognize that this conference is taking place at almost exactly the one-year anniversary of NATO's summit here in, in Warsaw. Uh, I actually had an opportunity to participate during the summit at the parallel Warsaw Summit Experts uh, Forum that was organized by NATO together with the Polish Institute of International Affairs here in, in Warsaw. Uh, while the adults were meeting in Warsaw National Stadium, uh, about 300 other professors and experts uh, such as myself were meeting in a circus tent across the parking lot. Uh, sometimes this felt a little bit silly, but it was really interesting to hear firsthand from many of the people attending the main summit. And one of the opening speakers there was President Duda of, of Poland, and one thing that stuck with me was his remark that for him, this summit was the second most important thing that had happened for Poland since the end of the Cold War. And the only thing that topped it was entry to NATO itself. So for him, this was really a, a big deal. Uh, so what I'll try to do in my 12 or so minutes is to talk a little bit about why for President Duda and other members, uh, leaders of the alliance, uh, Warsaw was so important and try to reflect on where we are a year after that summit, what remains to be done for NATO to respond to the Russian threat, especially of hybrid warfare. Okay, for, uh, for the Warsaw summit itself, the, the headline outcome was something that I think will be familiar to many of you in this room, uh, this initiative known as Enhanced Forward Presence. Uh, this was the initiative to finally have on a rotational basis four uh, NATO battalion-sized battle groups stationed here in Poland uh, under U.S. leadership, in Lithuania under Germany, 
in Latvia under Canada and in Estonia under, under British uh, leadership. Uh, an additional 12 NATO countries are contributing to, to the forces in, in those various countries, either this year or, or next. Uh, these are now all in, in place. And so having this kind of presence on the ground was seen as an important uh, reassurance for, for the countries involved, but also going beyond the simple kind of symbolic reassurance to a more robust defense and deterrence of, of Russian hybrid or conventional style warfare. It complemented a range of other military initiatives, both at Warsaw and, and previously, uh, decisions to increase the number of NATO-led exercises in the region, uh, the establishment of multinational brigade headquarters here in Poland and Romania, and an American bilateral initiative called the European Reassurance Initiative, which next year should spend about $4.8 billion, not only funding all these exercises, but putting in place more prepositioned equipment and helping to pay for the upgrade of various military infrastructures, such as airfields or seaports among the Eastern members of the NATO alliance. So you get this kind of alphabet soup uh, of, of different NATO initiatives on deterrence and defense. Now, for balance, NATO also wanted to balance, you know, have a, a third D uh, of dialogue with Russia to complement these moves, and that was symbolized especially by the resumptions of talks in Brussels under the framework of the so-called NATO-Russia Russia Council. Uh, those talks had not taken place for about two years from the spring of 2014 to the spring of, of last year. Uh, they've now resumed, and according to some of the NATO diplomats I've talked to, uh, these talks are valuable for at least two separate reasons. Uh, the first is that they do have a kind of channel of communication, which is important for expressing concerns and hopefully avoiding misunderstandings with Russia that could escalate to a, a higher level of conflict. Uh, however, the, the second type of benefit is that in an alliance of 28, now 29 members with different priorities and viewpoints, Nothing is more powerful for generating unity than listening to the Russian ambassador for a couple of hours. Uh, so this is also perhaps a, a benefit of the dialogue. And a, a third kind of a pillar of the, the NATO approach that has gotten a little bit less attention but was another of the, the main outcomes of the Warsaw Summit was this initiative around the idea of resilience. Uh, the idea that NATO members should be able to do more to uh, cope with unpredictable range of, of security threats, uh, certainly including this kind of low-level hybrid warfare as practiced by Russia. Uh, this was featured in a couple of different respects at Warsaw. Uh, the, within the main summit declaration, one of the articles identified resilience as a key enabler for collective defense. Uh, there was a separate document on enhancing allied resilience. And then resilience was also a, a prominent theme in a, a document on strengthening strategic partnership with the European Union. So this idea of being able to, uh, to have a, a robust ability to respond to a whole range of crises, uh, to be able to use the military and other security uh, resources of governments for civil defense, and also to be able to cope with hybrid warfare through stronger strategic communication are all elements of this increased focus on, on resilience. Uh, so this is kind of the, uh, the, the four-minute summary of what NATO has been doing. Uh, looking forward, there's a couple of, of questions, I think, that, that remain. Uh, the first is the natural one is, is all this enough? Uh, as we begin to prepare uh, to pay attention to the next Russia exercise, such as Zapad 17 with 100,000 forces, uh, is a few battalions in the Baltic states and, and Poland or a few additional exercises enough to respond to a, a full-scale Russian threat? Uh, the pessimist would say maybe not. Uh, they would look to various studies such as one by the RAND Corporation that estimated you need not four or five thousand troops on the ground but perhaps something closer to seven brigades or thirty to thirty-five thousand troops to really meaningfully be able to cope with a, a potential Russia attack. Uh, the optimist, would, on the other hand, would say it's not so much the total numbers, but the, the symbolism and political meaning of this presence. Uh, they will recall that during the, the Cold War, uh, the West German Chancellor in the 1950s, Konrad Adenauer, was at once asked, how many American troops do you need in Western Germany to feel safe from a Soviet invasion 
and his famous answer was one. Um, as long as I have one, uh, and the, Rush the Soviets know that if this person dies, you face the entire uh, re reaction from the United States. So perhaps this kind of, of dynamic applies here, but to the extent it does, it requires uh, also the ability to quickly return and reinforce these NATO forces on the ground, which means more money uh, and also uh, logistical improvements and legislative permissions to move them to where they need to be. Uh, a second, I think, ongoing question for NATO about this response is how to balance the response to the Russian threat on the so-called eastern flank with other security challenges for the alliance. Uh, it likes to talk about itself as being a 360 degree kind of organization. And in particular, right now, I can think of at least two other kinds of challenges uh, that are, are significant. Uh, one is this challenge that is sometimes referred to as the, the southern flank. Uh, the challenge is related to the overflow of migration or terrorism from the Middle East and North Africa in re recent years, uh, which is identified by several of the Mediterranean members of the alliance as their top priority, and which even the U.S. Secretary of State uh, Tillerson hinted was perhaps uh, the most important for the U.S. as well when it comes to, to terrorism. Uh, over the longer term, perhaps, though, another challenge will be how do you deal with the, the near eastern threat of, of Russia with the mix of challenges and opportunity of a rising Far East, uh, represented by China, India, and the broader Asia-Pacific region. Uh, so this was a, a question during the Obama administration, the, the issue of the, the pivot. Uh, but I think it also going, going forward will remain a, a question for the U.S. and for other European members of NATO. How do we balance these commitments to each other with our efforts to deal with the events in the Asia Pacific? So I think it's, uh, it's very notable that uh, tomorrow's version of this roundtable will focus precisely on, on that question. And, and last but not least, the third kind of issue going forward for, for NATO's response is this question of whether, given the other kinds of differences among the members of the alliance, uh, whether those differences will somehow undermine the, the unity and, and solidarity of the response vis-a-vis -vis Russia and hybrid warfare. Uh, to name just a few that you can pluck from the headlines, the, the ongoing drama of, of Brexit, uh, the United Kingdom's uh, withdrawal from the European Union, uh, debates within the EU on building a kind of multi-speed framework for the future, uh, which pits sometimes Germany and France on the one hand with members from Central and East European uh, members uh, in this part of, of, of Europe on the other, uh, and also the, the ongoing question of differing views of the Russia threat. Uh, again, there has been, I think, a basic agreement on a set of robust measures, both in terms of, uh, of the military response and economic sanctions. Uh, but this may not last into the future, and again, this is one of the, uh, the issues that's being watched very carefully, uh, also in involving U.S.-Russian relations. Uh, so for NATO going forward, it has already identified a couple of the next steps it wants to take in the next two to three years to cope with these remaining unresolved issues. Uh, NATO is talking about having another summit in the summer of 2018, probably in, in Brussels, and leading up to here, the next buzzword that will be the focus of the alliance apparently will be this idea of coherence. Uh, how do you bring all these different initiatives vis-a-vis -vis Russia, but also vis-a-vis -vis other challenges together into a, a kind of integrated fashion so they don't compete with each other? And perhaps if this can be achieved in, in 2018, uh, going forward in uh, 2019 or 2020, would be an effort to revise the existing strategic concept document of the alliance, which dates from 2010, uh, a very different period in European security, uh, but to try to use this kind of updating process as an opportunity to debate and come to a real consensus among the, the allies on where the relative priorities lie. Uh, so thanks for your attention. Uh, I'll be also watching what NATO is doing in the next two years very carefully and hope that uh, these next summits will be equally important to, to Poland as Warsaw last year. Thanks. Thank you very much. It's great to be back to Warsaw. Uh, nothing is more disappointing for a good Hungarian than seeing Warsaw, Prague, and Bratislava developing much faster than 
his or her own nation's capital. Okay, on a less sobering note, and it's beautiful what I see, what I see over here, I started to come to Warsaw in 1980, so not yesterday, but a little bit earlier. Uh, I have written notes because I never could otherwise make it in 12 minutes, unlike my colleagues who are so self-disciplined. I would start by saying that history never ends. And of course, at the same time, the speed of historical change varies. Sometimes not many things happen, sometimes a lot of things happen. And during the last few years, the changes in European security have again gained speed. Ukraine protracted conflict, or a protracted conflict in the making, I don't think we will escape it. Brexit, a tragedy. Eurozone crisis, migrant crisis, and Donald Trump in the White House. And please remember that I said a tragedy when I mentioned Brexit. OK. Uh, this has resulted in a shake-up of international relations. Objective circumstances, and I'm going to address East Central Europe, how the East Central Europeans relate to this matter. Uh, there are three fundamentals. The first one is the absence of great powers, and as a consequence, the dependence upon external security providers. The second, that history determined the role and allegiance of small and medium-sized East Central European countries. And the third one is that the fact these states un unisono changed their allegiances taken involuntarily after World War II did not change their size or power. As a consequence, they have remained policy takers or at best policy shapers. What happens now, or more precisely put in the last more than a decade, is important, but it's not a paradigm shift. This is not a paradigm shift, unlike the end of the Cold War. The changes are important, as they may indicate more lasting rearrangement of power relations or tremors. The Russian Federation, and I say three things about it, is back on stage. Its punches way above its weight. At the same time, its strengths and weaknesses are widely stretched. As a consequence, unlike smart great powers that rely on their strengths and do their best to diversify their power base, like China or India, Russia diversifies very little, if at all. And the consequence of this is that it stands on its strong foot. There is one area where Russia has been more successful than its predecessor, the Soviet Union, and that's its propaganda machinery. After some hesitation to accept a junior partner status, it turned its back on the system and has been trying to upset it. What we see in front of our eyes is an attempt to rearrange power relations, and not only in the post-Soviet space any longer, but somewhat beyond. Russia is back on the Western Balkans, Russia is there in Syria, and Russia is trying very actively to divide up East Central Europe. It's open to question whether its efforts will be successful or whether Moscow will end up in an imperial overstretch like Paul Kennedy described back in the 1980s. While in the post-Soviet space, Moscow is ready to use a full continuum of tools, including the employment of military power. The same cannot be ascertained in those areas where Russia has returned more recently. Russia uses its power tools, but is not employing military force. Whether it's a success of our deterrent, or whether it's the absence of intention, is something that we have to speculate about. The aim of Russia is to create divisions, gain influence, establish positions, and preferably weaken United Western positions and influence. Propaganda, credits, investments, corruption, useful idiots are all welcome. States that have, claim, that have claims that can be supported at relatively low cost are all fitting well in the Russian scheme. Think about Serbia. Serbia's Kosovo claim is backed up while Russia keeps a diplomatic representation in Pristina with 26 diplomats in an unrecognized entity, which is quite funny. Uh, Hungary did something similar in the 1930s when its revanchist claims were backed by Nazi Germany. Now, of course, does Russia want to break up the West as we know it? It depends. 
weakening Western unity. But some of these players are weakening Western unity as long as they are sitting around the table. Not that they are standing up and walking out. It's already good enough if sanctions are not deepening uh, and that contribution of some countries is valuable. And of course, Russia is much listened in some capitals and much less in others. It is listened to in Budapest, Sofia, Belgrade. How interesting, Turkey stream. Continuation in these directions, not in other directions. Or in Banja Luka, and somewhat less in Sarajevo. Luckier are those that have solid and lasting foundation to base their position uh, to Russia in turbulent times. This applies certainly to Poland and the Baltic states, so as to Romania. East Central Europe has never been one entity. As a consequence, it would be an illusion to speak about it. The countries of East Central Europe have gone through uneven development over the last quarter of a century. If we look at the matter through a different lens, there is reason to conclude that there are internal divisions and external pooling factors that result in clearer than ever differentiation. The political course of the East Central European countries is growing apart. This is something that we did not hear in the morning. However, in some issues, they share the same view, including the rejection of hosting refugees in one form or the other. Furthermore, the East Central European states have shared interest in maintaining the EU's resource reallocation system. The disagreements are partly based on a divergent political course, while some want to adhere to democratic values and principles and continue with democracy, others are interested in perpetuating their power nearly at any cost. There are variations of populism, but not every one of them presents lasting danger to the model that each and every Central European state declared to embrace upon the end of the Cold War. There is at least one where power must not be lost due to the criminal nature of the regime. The international environment has also become more divisive. The model that curtails, if not outright, rejects democracy as political foundation advances rapidly, offers immediate advantages to those in power, including financial ones, and helps with the perpetuation of power. If elections could be effectively influenced against the will of a state that had very extensive state capacity, what could be done in a country where the governmental authorities act in collusion with the intruder? The Hungarian foreign minister, while his country is chairing the V4, expressed his view that the group is in very good shape and standing. He understandably failed to mention that the group's cohesion, except for some superficial concord as far as the resettlement of migrants inside the EU, is largely over. Let me make a detour here to address an issue that is less frequently mentioned, the underlying concept of differentiation based on self-differentiation lost its foundation. When the Visegrad group started in 1991, and I happened to work in the foreign ministry of my country for some time during that period, I very well remember it was differentiation based on self-differentiation. The E4 is not standing out in East Central Europe any longer. States like Estonia and Slovenia have been performing better for a long time. Some others, like Romania, are catching up quickly, at least with Hungary. Hungary's authoritarian leadership gives eloquent demonstration of the fact that democratic transformation is reversible, democratic institutions can be weakened, checks and balances abolished, human rights undermined. His model is closely monitored and studied and occasionally followed in Warsaw. Fortunately, our Polish friends are more mature politically. The Hungarian leadership is also useful for some other states that can hide behind him with other populist although less confrontational agenda. Prime Minister Orbán's take the heat, confronts with Brussels, and others look better. I think leaders in Bratislava and Prague feel ashamed while Orbán gains popularity with confrontational style domestically. While Budapest and Warsaw share international interests, first and foremost in weakening the EU as a value community, 
making the, op the application of Article 7 of the Lisbon Treaty impossible, they are far apart in their strategic interests. For Viktor Orban, Moscow is a partner and role model and a source of income to extend further a sustainable economic situation beyond 2020. When he cannot buy Russian helicopters, he sends old ones there for repair. After repair, the helicopters still do not meet NATO standards, but rest assured, some reap some benefits. These factors understandably contribute to a significant weakening of regional cohesion and a partial rearrangement in East Central Europe. The weakening of V4 provides an opportunity to look for alternatives in Bratislava and Prague. As far as military security, beyond Poland, there are countries that take their defense commitment seriously and others which are less vehement on this. Take Romania, whose president found his way to the White House and Warsaw that hosted the US president for a few hours just a few days ago. Rest assured, Hungary's government will also wake up after the elections of spring 2018, noticing that defense procurement plus the chance of misappropriation of funds with the help of secrecy is a great combination. In sum, we are at the parting of the ways where rearrangement is well underway, but no end in sight yet. Thank you. Good afternoon. This is not very easy to now in this moment to add something original and interesting after you. However, I would like to comment two issues and raise the one new issue concerning with the Polish defense policy. First one, the Russia. For sure to understand the Russia, this is a very, uh, this is this is a very big challenge. Even in the Soviet era uh, was born a new area of science, the Sovietology, but in fact the main problem is that we don't know what is going behind the Kremlin doors. Uh, we don't know what, we don't know even what is the fit and the condition, the health condition of the Russian leader, is it fit, healthy or not? This is a question mark. Uh, Russians were able to surprise the world many times. Uh, we've got many examples for this. One is uh, Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact. Uh, this is a situation in Georgia in 2008. This is a Russian activity in Crimea in the 2014, 2000 uh, and and, this, and the development of the situation in the eastern, in the eastern Ukraine. The Russian policy is not the matter of the accident. This is, this is the matter of very precision plan, but the problem is that we don't know the goals of the plan. We only are able to observe the tactical moves or tactical victories of Russia However, we don't know what is the final picture, which is the main aim of the, of the Russia policy. Question about the Putin is, is very important and is very difficult to answer. If I am correct, according to the Russian law system, uh, the last, uh, the next one, the, after the nearest election, if Putin will be succeed, uh, will gain the success, it will be the last uh, cadency of Putin. So this is a very good question. What is his intention? What to do after this last cadency? And to build a more sophisticated picture of this situation, I have to add that we, in fact, we don't know what is the potential, what is the Russian internal opposition is able to do so, so to pre to predict to forecast what will happen in Russia after Putin or even af or even in next few years, this is this is very difficult and this is very very good question. Of course, we have to also remember that the. Uh, 
let's say, the way of thinking of Russian society and the Western society are rather not equal. There are there are different. This is this is because of the tradition, because of the religion, because of the many historical factors. So one very good, very important point, but very sophisticated is is Russia and question what will happen with the Russian with the Russian policy. The, I would like also comment hybrid warfare. I have to comment it because we look at the hybrid warfare as something new. This is not true. The term, the hybrid warfare itself was created after the master degree dissertation, uh, which was born in, uh, if I am correct, in the uh, Academy in Annapolis. The subject of the hybrid was uh, Chechen society, which was on one hand the traditional, even feudal Islamic society, and on other hand, it was the post-Soviet community. So this is this is in fact in in fact real hybrid. But if we are discussing the hybrid warfare, we have to remember that everyone war or, or armed conflict in fact is hybrid. For example, the war of Poland with the Teutonic Knights Orders in the in the beginning of the 15th century. It was also the hybrid. Let's remember, for example, the justified war theory raised by raised by Paweł Wodkowicz. Teutonic Knights claimed the Polish Polish king that he is a false Christian. Against it, we create the doctrine of the justified wars, and we uh, indicated that even pagans possess the right to defend itself against against the aggression. But uh, okay, that's enough with the with the comments about the what what about Polish defense policy and the strategic defense review which is the result of the work of the quite big team engaging about 200, 200 people in the Polish MOD. Since <clears throat> 90s of the 20th century, Polish security policy based on the three desired pillars. One is uh, membership of NATO, second one membership in the uh, European Union, the third one, the US military presence in the in the Europe. Today, after joining the NATO and the EU, situation is a little bit different. And most important than the presence of uh, US military forces in Europe, most important is presence of NATO forces in Central Europe and in eastern boundaries of of NATO. So but of course, this presence is a fact today. You mentioned this. We've got the few U.S. Uh, battalions. We've got the division. We will have a division command in uh, in in Poznan. We've got the NATO troops from Germany, uh, from from Denmark, from uh, Romania, in in Baltic states, in Poland. So this is. This is a good sign. This is a completely different situation than the few years ago, before the NATO summit in Newport, when no one even expected the NATO so big NATO presence in uh, in Central Europe. We have to also remember that uh, in a few years ago, four years ago. Five years ago, the discussion concerning the security and defense issues were dominate, was dominated by a few dogmas. One was uh, very close to the Immanuel Kant or Fukuyama concerning the end of the the end of history. The second, we we expected that in Europe the situation is stable. There are no threats in Europe. 
if we can expect some troubles, so we can expect it in the Middle East or, or maybe in some exotic parts of the, of the world. So only one uh, threat for Europe, it was uh, terrorism, in fact. Today, after, after the events on Crimea and Eastern Ukraine, we look at the situation and the security environment in a, in a completely different matter. The uh, armed forces of the, of the NATO countries, including, of course, the Polish armed forces, there are not a tool to demonstrate the solidarity, there are not only a tool today, there are not only a tool to demonstrate the solidarity with uh, different NATO countries. This is important. We are still doing because we support the French forces fighting in uh, Africa. We sent some supply for them. Polish forces participated in operations in Iraq, in Syria, we've got the military contingents in Iraq and, and Kuwait. We participated in missions in uh, Afghanistan and uh, in, uh, in uh, former Yugoslavia. So we are still doing. But we also, today, we have to stress the ability of the armed forces to defend our own country and our own borders. Of course, the Article 5, this magic formula, is, is very important. And this is a base of our military doctrine. This is a base of our deterrence policy. Because we, we with our own uh, potential, we are not rather able to deter, uh, for example, the Russians to and uh, prevent the Russian forces to make some aggressive moves. Uh, so the terence the, and the Article 5 is, is very important. But this Article 5 is, is, is mentioned very, very, very often by, by everyone. We have to also remember about the Article 3. Article 3 concerns the uh, necessity for every one country to build their own defense potential and prepare the capability to, for, the, for the deployment of the, of the NATO forces. So if we want to count on the Article 5 and the support from the United States and other NATO countries, like, uh, for example, uh, Great Britain or Germany, we have to possess capability to defend our own borders. Because we have to remember that the presence of the NATO forces is, is not very big, is, is rather limited. This is a few battalions, it of course increased the defense capabilities of, of Poland and the Baltic states. We can say that even drastically increase our defense capability, but in fact this is not enough to prevent uh, the potential military aggression. So my intention is not to demonize the possibility of the military aggression, However, armed forces have to be ready to deter and to prevent the military aggression. So this is the reason why we have developed capabilities of our armed forces, not only to participate in the missions, but also we have to be able to provide the defense of our own borders. Uh, if we have armed forces capable to defend our own country, we also have to capabilities to support other NATO nations and participate in the missions. If we have armed forces capable only to 
participate in the missions, we lose the capability to defend our, uh, our own borders. So this is reason why the strategic defense review have given a lot of recommendations. One of them is uh, increasing of number of troops uh, in, the, in the Polish armed forces. This is why we Polish government make, made a decision concerning the creation of the territorial defense forces. So some activities are parallel to the strategic defense review. So because uh, we have to take some uh, some actions not not with the losing losing time and we cannot uh, and we cannot wait uh, until uh, let's say uh, acceptation of the strategic defense review by the uh, by the government so the main idea of the Polish SDR, this is the acronym for the Strategic Defense Review, is of course to be in line with the policy, put the stress on the importance of the NATO and on the EU, but we also have to be a kind of hub for the, for the NATO forces in the, in the Central Europe. And this is the reason why I talked so much, so much, uh, and yes, so much about the article, article three uh, of the North Atlantic Treaty. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I have to say I'm very impressed by not only the quality of your presentations, but also by your self-discipline because everybody basically kept to the, the time frame, which gives us quite a bit of time to ask questions. Uh, I would like to note, I never thought about the Teutonic Knights' uh, accusations against the Polish king as fake news, but I think you convinced me in the context of uh, the recent visit of uh, President Trump here in, in Warsaw. Uh, and I have a question for Professor Dunai. Uh, I'm surprised to hear him say, uh, in his comparison of, of Hungarian and, and Polish officials, that uh, he thinks that Polish officials are better than the Hungarian officials, or something to that effect. And uh, my suggestion is that you spend more time in this country, sir. I, to tell you the truth, uh, I have not spent much time in Hungary for a very, very long time as a consequence. I don't always have direct experience with my own uh, politicians. Uh, what I see on the output side is uh, not particularly reassuring, but it's particularly in this, in this area of security because and, and we, when we discuss security issues, Poland, of course, has a very firmly anchored uh, basis of its own security, whereas in a number of other countries there is this more hesitant, less strategic vision-based version and as a consequence I miss uh, what we were more uh, committed to about a decade ago or whatever we promised uh, before our accession. You know our Polish friends are spending more on defense and the question is not only spending more, it's also how you are spending, what you are spending, what is the output. Uh, my country is lagging behind, I understand why, uh, but of course uh, the question when we are going to start spending more will be where we are spending, how we are spending, how we are going to guarantee that we have output uh, on our in our defense sector. You know? We have a good number of problems in, in, our, in our security and we are still not making up our mind. Okay, we are going to have elections in, in, in April next year. More or less, you know who will win it. Uh, and, and I'm not, I did not say that Comrade Stalin used to say that it doesn't matter, uh, how, not, it, not, it, it's not the issue how people vote, the issue is how we count them. Uh, no, the issue is that there is every reason to believe that the current government uh, with a fractured democratic opposition is going to continue in office. And then of course the question is going to be whether we are going to back our verbal commitment by, by, by actions. 
Very good, thank you. Uh, I open the floor to questions, and if you would be so kind and allow the person with the microphone to bring you the mic and you can identify yourself uh, before you speak. Hello, my name is Ilyas, I'm from Kazakhstan, uh, Nazarbayev University, Graduate School of Public Policy. First of all, thank you very much for organizing such a beautiful conference. It's very productive, very interesting thoughts. I have two questions. First is to professor from the United Kingdom, I believe Professor Grime Hurt. So uh, in the context of uh, Russian-Turkish relationships, in the context of the population of Russian population, in the context of active attraction of um, labor force migrants from Central Asian countries to Russia, do you think that a religion of Islam may become one of central gravity forces to unite not only Russian, uh, Russian population, current citizens of Russian, but also Central Asian, post-Soviet country? Uh, second question to Professor Dunai. Uh, 100 years back from now, when the, when there was, when the Soviet uh, USSR was just established, and by that period, uh, Kazakh intelligence and other Turkic intelligence um, tried to build their own central power, Turkestan. I believe you know, you heard about it, Alash party, but unfortunately they've been all uh, prosecuted during the Stalin regime. Do you think, or do you think there is a potential of Turkic nations? And what is the role of Turkic nations? You know that there is Chechens, Tatars, Yakuts in Russia, and there is Uzbeks, Kyrgyz, Uyghurs. Do you think that there is a role and potential of Turkic nations? during and the post-Putin period in Russia. And uh, to Mr. I believe professor from Poland, uh, what should be a response policy of Central Asian countries' leaders during post-Putin's period? Thank you. So maybe we answer them in the order given. Um, I, so if the question was, can Islam be a unifying glue that holds together Central Asia, Russia, and Turkey, um, something they have in common, and a bridge, essentially, uh, Russia as a civilizational bridge and using Islam uh, as, as, as part of that bridge, uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. A um, couple of reasons for that. Uh, firstly, in the Russian narrative at the moment, it's all about St. Petersburg, to Palmyra. It's all about Christian, Byzantium, Orthodox, Slavic, etc. That's what's being pressed. Secondly, Patrushev and others, head of the National Security Council, are talking about 4,000 foreign fighters returning to the Caucasus. I think they mean uh, North Caucasus. Um, and uh, returning radicalized and ready to uh, carry out an insurrection or insurgency. And under those conditions, when they're uh, radicalized Salafi, Wahhabi, Delabani sect, or whatever they are, ISIS, um, Al-Qaeda types, it, under, under those conditions, it's very hard to see um, Russia, uh, it's very, very easy to see Russia using brutal tactics, essentially trying to annihilate them. The war in Syria is all about annihilation of these, uh, these characters. Novaya Gazeta published an article about a green corridor in 2014-15 out of the North Caucasus to push radicalized elements into Syria where they can be um, you know, executed essentially more effectively. Um, plus, there's one other kind of issue, which is uh, Russia at the moment is in a Christian Shia Orthodox coalition, a four plus one, to use Lavrov's phrase, coalition. That is to say, Iran, Iraq, Syria, uh, Russia plus Hezbollah. So Revolutionary Guards Force supported Hezbollah. Um, and, and, and it's actually, the difficulty Russia has is it looks as if it's taken the Shia side in a Sunni-Shia conflict within the Middle East. So to give support to Sunni elements, difficult to see. 
even Gata and Russia's position on Gata is maybe a lead indicator uh, of, of, of that and where it's positioning itself. Very last point, 15 to 20%, according to Alexei Malashenko in Moscow Konegi Center, 15 to 20% of the Russian population is Islamic, but it's not clear, uh, you know, within that you have very many different variants. Those that do drink alcohol, those that don't, those that pray five times a day, those that have been on the Hajj, etc., etc. So you see, a, you see a lot of variation. And the labor migrant workers, this is maybe something Paul can talk of more, but them coming to Russia, this is more, much more of a, a tool in Russian foreign policy of a third of GDP of Tajikistan or Kyrgyzstan. Half Tajikistan is made up of migrant worker remittances. This is a, a tool of control. And Russia can use administrative measures, change uh, registration, for example, um, paperwork, as a way of strategically signaling with Dushanbe and Bishkek for example, um, uh, where it is. So if you want to have a color revolution, a Russian-backed color revolution, so-called, you know, in Tajikistan, send all the 18 to 30-year-old male workers, migrant workers, make them unemployed, send them back. And uh, it's a very powerful tool, actually, in, in Russia interstate relations. So it uses it for that rather than Islam as a bridge. Thank you. The answer, the short answer is no. <laughs> The longer answer is that uh, it can be a complementary factor of many others. Ever since uh, President Erdogan started with this Turkic summits, uh, the idea is good, but it's not a decisive change in the Central Asian region, not to mention, of course, not every Central Asian state is Turkic speaking bearing in mind that the Tajiks are not. I think, uh, as I lived in Central Asia, the future of Central Asia will be far more determined by the two main actors which are playing a massive and significant role over there, which are definitely the Russian Federation and China. As a consequence, I basically think that Central Asia will be more or less, as far as the establishment, happily embracing the model that China and the Russian Federation will offer them, uh, which means a relatively fast economic growth, if possible, combined with non-democratic uh, political edifice. And that's what I think is going to lastingly decide what happens in Central Asia. For Central Asia, I think the fundamental issue is not to disappear. And of course, your country very kindly uh, I try to say something positive after I said so many other things. Uh, something positive. When, when I go to Astana or Almaty and meet people and they speak about Kazakhstan is Srednya Asia, that I learned 30 years earlier, 35 years earlier. So you are trying to basically disengage from the other Central Asians which are definitely far less developed than you are. Uh, how the things will change is, is a little bit unpredictable for a variety of reasons. One of them, that when, when President Mirziyoyev came into office in Uzbekistan, nobody really had much of a hope. We said, oh, he's 73, he was prime minister for 13 years behind Islam Karimov, what can we expect? Continuity. And a lot of things are happening uh, due to the fact that you often don't know when you are, when somebody is the number two, how that person will behave when he becomes number one. My best example, obviously, is Nikita Khrushchev, who was playing in Stalin's courtyard as it was necessary, and then three years later went to the rostrum in Moscow and uh, basically make, made a break with the Stalinist regime at the 20th Party Congress. Uh, Indeed, the issue is the external dependence, and I don't think that there is a big race for Central Asia any longer. So basically, the other players are either very lukewarm, just think about the United States that was cutting 50% of its development aid to Kyrgyzstan, and the same happens with respect of other countries. I don't mention your state, because your country is, first of all, as of now, very well managed. Second, you are in spite of all the little hiccups stemming from the world economy, you are, uh, you are well off, you know, you are 
a higher middle, higher middle income country, so you don't need external support. Turkey, going back to the original thing, Turkey is not going to provide a role model, not to mention Turkey is massively facing an overstretch. Currently, if you just take a look to the economy of Turkey, the high hopes that we associated with, with President Erdogan's uh, last 15 or so years are no longer there. Turkey has gotten to the level when it's above the world per capita GDP average, but it's, it's now sort of a stalemated country. As a consequence, I think Turkey will be better advised to integrate more than disintegrate. Uh, as a consequence, I don't think that anybody can move Central Asia together except if there is determination in the region. And I see some determination. The most recent speech of President Mirziyoyev where he, where he openly said that there is no reason to assume that there will be a war in Central Asia. That was very good news. As a consequence, I, I have some hopes, but I have no decisive hopes. And Turkey is not going to have the necessary weight and power to pull the region out. One comment on, on migration. In 2015, of course, there was a major problem because the, the remittances went down significantly in case of Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. Now they are back, by and large, to the 2014 and before level, which is good news for the countries. I think for these countries, the biggest challenge is going to come with a Russian policy, which is ready to give Russian passports to anybody who was born in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union came to an end 26 years ago. As a consequence, there may be many people who believe that it's high time to finish this kind of moving back and forth, working in Moscow, living in Dushanbe, and they will resettle to the Russian Federation, which may actually alleviate some of the problems of these countries, but create many others. Matt Rhodes, can you tell us something about uh NATO's efforts to tighten cooperation with Finland and Sweden in the context of what's going on in the Baltic now? Yeah, I mean, these are um, obviously two of the closest partners of, of NATO. They've been involved in a number, again, of these, these initiatives from, from recent summits. Um, maybe going back, again, in, in the summit terms to the, the Wales summit of, of September of 2014, there were a couple of things that took place there that were especially important for, for Sweden and Finland. Uh, one is that using that summit as a kind of a meeting uh, opportunity, uh, those two countries signed uh, so-called host nation uh, support agreements with NATO to allow NATO troops to, to exercise or potentially come uh, in, a, in a crisis uh, to those countries. Uh, there was also um, something called a, an enhanced uh, opportunities partners uh, initiative uh, passed there for five countries, including both Finland and Sweden, along with Jordan, Iraq, and um, the fifth one will come to me later, but it doesn't matter, but to give them kind of additional opportunities to work more closely with NATO early on in NATO planning. Uh, to improve their interoperability with the alliance. So, so these are two countries that uh, step by step are kind of pushing the, the envelope of what NATO partnership allows to, to non-members. They are becoming really the, the closest two non-member partners of the alliance. Uh, I think at the same time there's an ongoing political debate in those two countries about whether taking that final step you know, making it legal, uh, as we say, when uh, you know, two young people are considering getting married um, and actually becoming full members. Uh, it seems that public opinion is becoming more supportive of that, but it's still not quite at that final threshold where they are ready to say, yes, this is what we want to do. Um, they seem to have linked their decision to, to making kind of a mutual decision that you would each come in uh, only if the other was, was doing the same thing. Uh, but in, in the meantime, uh, there's much more sharing of, of information, including fairly sensitive information about defense within the alliance. Uh, there's a lot of cooperation with Finland and Sweden within the context of the, the Nordic defense cooperation, uh, especially for the defense of the, uh, of the Baltic Sea. Uh, there's more exercises in involving those, those two countries. Uh, certainly in, um, involvement of, of Finland in particular in this uh, initiative to 
advance the idea of resilience uh, within the EU and, and NATO and, and their partners. So, so they're becoming, I think, closer and closer, um, more so than any other partner nations of the alliance. And it's potential that uh, within the next, say, three to five years, they could actually make a decision to, to become full members. Just to, just to follow on, um, so r Swedish newspapers are reporting uh, counterintelligence officers in Sweden as saying that half the Russian embassy in Stockholm is FSB and that they're carrying out critical um, infrastructure, national infrastructure mapping in communications, media and um, energy sectors. And so this is part of the resilience issue of making the public aware, raising awareness within society as to um, you know, Russian destabilization efforts. And I think that has an impact, obviously, on then threat perceptions within Sweden and Finland about Russia and Russia's intent. What some analysts argue uh, is that um, if you have elite consensus or a shift at the, at the, within the elites, as you've had in Germany vis-a-vis -vis Russia after 2014, then society follows. So the lead indicator would be, what are the political elites saying, I think, in Finland and Sweden? If they move, society will follow them. If they, if they frame, frame the, and lead the debate about membership, and they're not there yet. So it's very interesting from a Russian perspective, what would Russia have to do to have a decisive sh shift or shock amongst the elite that then pushes for uh, NATO membership? Um, and that would, be, that would be extremely interesting uh, and, and is, is this issue of brinkmanship, Russia doing brinkmanship, does it know where the brink is? You know, you have thresholds that you cross thresholds and, and you, sh you have a paradigm shift in opinion. Is Russia aware of, of does it have the knowledge really of those societies? And uh, because Russia clearly doesn't want uh, those two states. What Russia's pushing for is a non-block or non-aligned space from Finland, Sweden, through Belarus, Ukraine, into the Western Balkans, via Moldova, Georgia, etc and to have a kind of cordon sanitaire, a non-aligned block, a buffer zone around itself. So this would be highly, highly counterproductive, which goes, I guess, to the issue of Russia's very good at tactics, has a vision, but no strategy, um, and therefore cumulative losses uh, are, are uh, the result. If I can just also comment that on that. I mean, we talked uh, this morning as well about various dates that are kind of geopolitical turning points, 2008, 2014, uh, and, and others. Uh, it was interesting that already in, in 2007, although we think of, of Finland in terms of Finlandization and accommodation of the Soviet Union during the Cold War and of, of Russia since, uh, already in 2007, the defense minister of Finland at that time gave a speech in Washington, D.C., in which he famously identified the top three security concerns for Finland as Russia, Russia, and Russia. Uh, it seemed paranoid at, at the time, but uh, since is a little bit less so. So I wonder, Professor Krulikovsky, the, the um, notion of territorial defense, which is being discussed now in the press, and particularly over the last two weeks when the new uh, defense review came out, um, is this, is this an idea that this government has pushed uh, since it came into power? Because I recall a very long time ago, at least 10 years ago, perhaps as long as 15 years ago, uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski talking about this and saying that uh, the Russians are on the Belarusian border and if they wanted to, they could be in Warsaw in just a few hours. Uh, so the idea was out there much earlier than, uh, well, than the last two weeks. Uh, and my question is essentially, is it this government that is, has awoken to this situation and it's a reaction to what happened in Ukraine? So the new uh, Russian uh, tactic of jab, uh, grab, and hold, uh, and, and the awareness that old NATO uh, strategy uh, was no longer adequate uh, to prevent that kind of scenario. The answer is yes. That's one. Second, the territorial defense is not only the Polish idea. For example, the, of course the names are different. So, and the forms are different. So in the United States, there is a National Guard, which is uh, different than the Polish territorial defense. However, this is a kind of the territorial service. 
so there is a territorial defense and territorial defense forces command in Norway, for example. There is a strong territorial defense in Finland, in Sweden. So this is not only the Polish original idea. Uh, so the reason mentioned by you is, is very important, but there are also a few other reasons. One is uh, because we need uh, more soldiers uh, in, a prof in a professional army. We've got only 100,000 people, which is, not, which is not enough. Today is a free, not the full-blooded, full-sized uh, di divisions. This is not enough to provide the country defense. Uh, so we have to find also the solution for the reserve training. So we, of course, we are going to extend the forms and let's say the offer of the forms of the reserve trainings uh, for, the, for the students, for the uh, boys and girls from the, from, the, from the middle schools. However, the territorial defense, this is one of the tools to extend and enlarge the reserve uh, training. Uh, so pro territorial defense, is also important for the saturation of the territory of, of Poland, especially in the area neighboring to the not NATO, uh, not NATO, not NATO countries. So, of course, there is uh, some discussion about the quality of the territorial defense, about way of the training, but let's give the chance for the new formation for example, uh, because this is a problem with the, with the language, we use very often uh, the, in Polish, wojsko zawodowe czy wojsko profesjonalne, yes? In English, this is, this is the same word for this two, two form of the, of the military service. However, I would like to say that, for example, the Israeli armed forces are conscript armed forces, but no one is going to say that the Israeli army is not professional. Yes, so let give the chance of the, for the territorial defense, defense in Poland. This is not, a, I think, personally, that this is not a stupid idea. This is a quite effective way to extend the Polish defense capabilities. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Uh, Mariusz Antonowicz, Vilnius University. I'd like to ask a question. Given the fact that that country has the second largest army in NATO, do you consider Turkey as a security issue and as a certain ticking bomb inside of NATO, given, given what has been happening there for the last two or one and a half years. Thank you. Who are you directing your question to? Uh, to all the panelists, thank you. I, I, I guess I'll, I'll start, but uh, hope for relief for my, my colleagues. I mean, certainly there's a, a lot of strain and, and concern about the relationship with Turkey. Uh, maybe the biggest, most immediate thing is that perhaps something like a third of the, the officer corps, including many who have served in, in NATO positions in, in Brussels and other commands, have been arrested or dismissed from their positions under suspicion of involvement in the, the coup attempt against Erdogan last, last summer. So all of a sudden, as you said, you have your, uh, your biggest or second biggest uh, military force in a way almost decapitated in terms of professional experience and uh, with, with some questions at least on the, the validity of the charges in, in some of the cases in, involved. So this is, is one concern. Uh, the second concern, of course, is the, the relationship between Turkey and Russia, and including the talks between Turkey and Russia for the purchase of uh, air defense missile systems, uh, which would not be compatible with, with NATO uh, systems and uh, could lead to kind of a, a Russian a larger Russian military presence in terms of uh, advice and maintenance uh, and operation of, of the systems on, on Turkish territory. And then there's the, the ongoing concern about the direction of, of Turkish politics, whether it will remain true to the, the democratic values that are 
mentioned in the, the Washington Treaty and which are you know, a, a foundation of, of the alliance. Um, at the same time, I think they recognize the importance of Turkey, not only the other allies recognize the importance of Turkey, not only for its, its large size and its, its large military, but its, its key geographic location. And that especially as the, the alliance is concerned also of, of fighting terrorism, of uh, fighting ISIS in, in Syria and elsewhere, uh, this location is of, of particular relevance and importance. So I think there will be every effort by the alliance to, to keep Turkey at least formally on side, uh, even though there is this, this kind of suspicion and, and doubts about its, its future trajectories, uh, with one um, kind of small symbolic result is that next year's NATO summit is expected to take place now in, back in Brussels, whereas before there were a lot of talks about it possibly being in, in Istanbul. Um, others like to jump in. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, just really to agree with Matt, um, what you see in Turkey is a move to one party state, uh, historical charismatic legitimation of political authority from legal rational, rather like in Russia. So it's kind of paradigm shift that we're seeing. And the impact on NATO is, is that Turkey is no longer an anti A2 AD player in the Black Sea region. Um, which really puts all the emphasis now on Romania, Bulgaria in that part of the world, which don't have the capabilities really to perform that function. Um, the, the kind of one ray of hope is that the, the Putin-Erdogan relationship is not really institutionalized, it's very personal. And we saw in 2015, was it, with a Sukhoi 28 being shot down, or 27, that uh, the, because of that, the relations can really shift very quickly. So the end game now around Mosul and Raqqa, what goes on in Syria, um, where the uh, Kurds are in the north that have relations with the PKK, which is the, you know, for, for Turkey, Syria is like Ukraine for Russia, if you like. And this is really the backyard of Turkey. And the number one threat is uh, Rojave project, so Kurds in the north of Syria getting access to the sea and having an independent uh, area. So how Russia can play that, um, go after ISIS, but not support, the, I suppose from a Russian perspective it's all about not supporting the Kurds as much as the Americans are. And as long as you can do that, you've got, uh, you know, the Americans take the heat, if you like, from Erdogan more than the Russians. But it's a difficult balancing act, I think, for them. In, uh, so relations could go, in other words, relations look as if they're moving the right way, the political systems are moving in the same direction, the world view is coming closer and closer, the kind of authoritarian Moscow consensus uh, is, is, you know, the Ankara consensus is some sort of neo-Ottoman project that uh, Erdogan seems to be pushing. Um, how long that lasts with the economy, that's maybe something Paul uh, alluded to earlier. So how sustainable this project is, is, is open to question. Thank you. So I would like also add that this is a very beautiful example of how dynamic is the present situation. We can remember, for example, the tension after the shooting down the Russian plane, the Su-24 by the Turkish F-16. And today we've got the joint or combined operation of the Turkish and the Russian troops in in Syria. So we have to also raise the question of the intention of the Erdogan. I agree with this, let's say, going to the one party authoritarian system of governing of the country. But also interesting is the position of the son of the president Erdogan. This is a question mark. If someone will visit his profile on the Facebook, uh, we will be able to notice that uh, his, uh, let's say, um, this this profile is very is very pro-Islamic and very friendly for the Islamic Brotherhood. This is also a question: What will be the evolution of the uh, of the ideology and the system of governing in in, in, in Turkey? Yes, 
thank you, um, Andris Sprutz, uh, Latvian Institute of International Affairs. Uh, thank you so much for the, I think, excellent insights, especially on, on Russian thinking and behavior. Namely, basically describing it's the geopolitical thinking, zero-sum game, uh, thinking, the, thinking in terms of zones of influence. This is the Russian side, fully subscribed to this. I think what is important for me, coming from Latvia, of course, what are responses from our region? If we speak about regional security, so how do we respond to this? In the morning, in opening session, I was a little bit surprised to hear that the country should promote geopolitical vision. I quote, because for me so far, I was taught that for small countries to promote geopolitical vision actually is a risky business usually end up in dividing the zones of spheres of influence. So that's why my question is, so what are those sort of the fundamentals of thinking for the Central and East European countries? It's about regionalization or sub-regionalization. We see three C's initiative. Is it about some kind of gravitating towards the core of Europe, about Germany? Is it about a previously rules-based order and norms and institutions? Or is it really about promoting the geopolitical vision? Would you agree with that statement, what was said in the morning by the keynote speakers? Thank you. Sure. Yeah, uh, I, I think I missed that this morning. I, I got the Q&A, so I missed the promoted geopolitical vision. I think more than a geopolitical vision, promote a a positive conception of a political system, so of a market democratic system and the virtues of that system. So it's almost going back to Cold War and Cold War propaganda when um, the West strength was its ability to say accountability, transparency, checks and balances, uh, this makes for stability, this makes for adaptable systems that can survive when you have systemic shocks, survive better than uh, brittle hard powers, as Paul said, not multidimensional, just essentially military hard power that's very brittle, that when a systemic shock comes, it can collapse. So it's the, you know, it's just the logic of why it's virtuous, why it's useful to have uh, market democratic political systems. Um, also, in terms of regionalization, um, so when it comes, for example, to discuss with Russia transponders, what Russia would want to do is to make that a Latvia-Russia discussion. And actually globalization is a, is a better response for Latvia to say, hey, the planes crossing Latvia, the civilian airliners are going to China. So China should be in the room to discuss this issue. This isn't a, a, a Latvian Baltic, if you like, Russian discussion. This is, we're in a global, globally integrated system. From a Russian perspective, I think there's this thesis about sovereign globalization, which is really interesting, which is the notion that what Russia wants, to trying to understand the, where Russia is and what Russia wants, is to have its economy integrated, so its commodity-based export economy, integrated enough into the global economy so that Russia can survive. But psychologically, culturally, socially, politically, isolate its own population from alien influences, as Karaganov would say. Uh, the, you know, that cross. And so to do that, what you want is influence, not control, of adjacent territory. You don't want control because you can't afford to. All you can really do if you're Russia is destabilize. So you can't afford to, if you were directly controlling that territory, stabilize it. Um, and that you don't have the resources, you know, overstretches would, would become a key there. So the idea then is not territorial conquest, but influence of political and other you know, foreign and security policies, this Finlandization notion, essentially. And sovereign globalization, I think, Russia thinks will best allow that. If you look at the 26th of March youth protests, anti-corruption protests in Russia, it kind, of, it's kind of suggests that this is a false hope, a false paradigm, that information cannot be uh, contained. When 17 million people are watching on YouTube you know, don't call him demon, or he's not demon to you. Another 17 or so million, so 35 million, um, all in all, through other social media, are seeing this. It just shows the authorities can't suppress and isolate Russia as you maybe could in the Cold War. In, in a globalized, in a globalized world, it's no longer possible. But um, 
Yeah, so those would be my thoughts on you know, geopolitical vision, not, but political system, market democratic based, is a much more, it, you know, it, it's a much easier product to sell, if you like. It makes more sense to do that, in my view. Okay, and again, this uh, effort by diplomats and, uh, and experts at think tanks like yours to define the, the combination of realism and, and vision is, is what we have to do. And uh, perhaps this uh, new buzzword for NATO of coherence, uh, which they're trying to refer to their various initiatives to deal with security threats in different parts of the world um, and different programs and initiatives, also kind of, ref uh, I think, refers or would apply to, uh, to all countries, including smaller ones' efforts to, to go about their, their foreign policy and vision so that their, their regional relations fit in and, and support and complement uh, their broader Euro-Atlantic ones, which in turn should fit in to the extent that they also have a, a certain global level vision or, or preferred outcomes. So to try to see how these things fit together rather than compete with one another, at least as a starting point for, for countries. Uh, very briefly, the following. Uh, Russia is definitely taking advantage of Western divisions weaknesses, loss of orientation. Uh, and there is not much else to do than reverse this. <laughs> be more united, be more aware of the values, principles, and norms you are applying. I basically see this happening on a certain level of the US administration. Uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis visited the Marshall Center just, was it two weeks ago or so? And held a speech, and it's worth reading, it's on defense.gov, you can find it. How many times he referred to principles and norms and values. So while some people believe that this is the era of transactionalism, this is actually very effectively compensated by some people who are very well aware that if we say, okay, this is a geopolitical contest, and you can end up here or you can end up there, then how are we going to differentiate ourselves from our main challenger, uh, rival, whatever? So that's the first, first issue. Market democratic, you know, the, the issue is not always some relatively marginal human rights that you are respecting. The question is indeed democracy and good governance. And when you are giving up on good governance, very soon you end up in massive uh, corruption, as my country is heading to. Uh, I think we were the second best that went down eight uh, positions in the, on the Transparency International Corruption Perception Index. Only country that could do better than us was three years ago or four years ago, Slovenia, which went back 12 positions. Now, of course, if you think about Poland, which was 134 in 2014, and number 44 as of now, which is absolutely, no, that's Georgia, I'm sorry. But Poland also made about 30 or 40 points. So some countries can really break out and indicate that you can do a lot with good governance. Poland, I think, was 67th about seven, eight years ago, and now, is way above many in East Central Europe, which is indication. And this, of course, will result in economic well-being, in behavior of investors, and so on and so forth. You can drag it out, but you are not going to be able to say goodbye to good governance. If you don't have good governance, sooner or later, you are not going to have the rest either. Uh, the next one is Russia has two uh, inconsistencies. One of them, Russia is a country which is very much a sovereignty-based, Westphalian system-based country. At the same time, the Russian Federation denies full-fledged sovereignty of a good number of other countries, which is basically the Russian conception, only great powers are sovereign, the rest don't matter. I don't want to refer to the lovely saying of a Russian leader who said about Poland that Poland is a cloned state, and if you want to speak to Warsaw, we speak to Washington. That happened about a decade ago. Uh, the person is well known who said it. Uh, and so on and so forth. So, so this kind of behavior is totally inconsistent. The other inconsistency, that Russia wants to maximize its sovereignty while reaping economic benefits from globalization. The two things will not go hand in hand for a long time. 
The last one is, and it's already a bridge to the next panel where I will be able to speak about Russian-German relations, uh, while we speak about unity in Europe and while we have some doubts occasionally about how much the United States is going to be with us on every day, uh, we have to notice a move of the power center. Whether you are going to be happy or not, I can't help you with that, uh, but the power center is very significantly moving from Brussels to Berlin. So we will have to cope with the fact that a united Europe or a united extended Western Europe will be very much under German leadership and we will be just, just as excited about German elections, not now, when they are not going to be particularly exciting on September 24, I hope. Uh, President Erdogan to, could contribute, sending a few million migrants. Uh, okay, uh, but if we, if we don't take that, but at the next elections, we will be just as excited about German federal elections as we were excited on November 8 last year. Thanks. Laura Georgiou, University of Graz. Uh, two questions for Professor Hart. Uh, first of all, when you mentioned the strong points and the weak points of uh, Russia, uh, you uh, put on that list the idea of neo-modernism. Can you explain it a little bit? Because my question is whether this neo-modernism has uh, strong connections to uh, Orban's uh, idea of illiberal democracy. That's the first question. And the uh, second question is perhaps more theoretical. Uh, you didn't mention anything about um, Euro-Asianism, about this narrative. Is it slowly slowing down, as I feel it, or it um, really lost any chance to influence the security story? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And others, of course, can answer uh, that question as well. So neo-modernism, this is, um, I came across a reference, REAC, uh, the foreign ministry think tank, under uh, Andrei Kortunov a couple of months ago uh, discussed this idea that Dugin is putting forward and other nationalists, ultra-nationalists in Russia. And it's the idea that essentially we are postmodern in Europe and we're failed and dysfunctional and we're destabilizing and we're de decadent and we're on the wrong side of history. But Russia returning to the past, eternal, great, glorious, you know, uh, uh, Russian, Russian past with Russian historical exceptionalism and messianism at the heart of it um, is, is neo-modernist. So neo-modernist is essentially nationalism, transactionalism, holism, and historicism. It sounds very much like the Russian uh, education minister who talked of orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationalism. What it essentially does I think it's a kind of alibi for deferred modernization. So we're not going to modernize. We're not going to do structural economic reform. Uh, we're not going to liberalize. Uh, we're a besieged fortress, and so we go back to the past. And Kortunov ended his discussion of neo-modernism by saying, quote, unquote, can we really march into the future with our eyes on the past? You know, the, the past is glorious. The future is going to be glorious and the present is empty. There's nothing happening in the present, so we don't talk about the present, we just focus in on the past. Uh, it indicates path dependency, patrimonial pattern of governance is still there, I think, in Russia. And that the status quo is stability um, and order, and any reform or any change is inherently destabilizing, and therefore we shouldn't do it. But. I think it's an excuse or an alibi for an elite that realizes that they run Russia and they own Russia, and if you change the structure of the economy, they're going to lose power, and they don't want that. And so they're willing to put their own uh, cynical um, interests above that of the longer-term sustainability of the state, um, which is a shame. But that's essentially neo-modernism, I think. Uh, it's interesting to see if it takes off as an idea in Russia. 
because uh, the so-called Moscow Consensus, something David Lewis has written about, if you look uh, last year, I think, in, uh, I forget the paper, but David Lewis and Moscow Consensus, he looks at four or five governing characteristics of um, the Russian political system and how that also translates into a strategic posture that Russia wants others to adopt. And it's kind of linked with uh, neo-modernism. So it's kind of philosophical background. And I think it may, you know, when Lavrov starts to talk about it, then you, that's a kind of indicator that um, it's, it's, it's an idea whose time has come. Thank you. Maybe very briefly, uh, I always agree with Graham. That's the, that's the starting point. Um, the, the Russian Federation had a great opportunity when it had its drawers full of money to modernize everything. They missed this opportunity. They did not diversify the economy, except that they are going to have significantly more defense export. That's something that is high value added export, you know, at least. You know, it's not grain and diamond and, and oil and uranium. Uh, so there is something. They, they missed the opportunity fundamentally. Now the drawer is empty. They are not generating the revenue, which is sufficient to have this exquisite lifestyle of, of people in Moscow. Russia is not Moscow. And 95% of Russian television time is Moscow, eventually St. Petersburg, a little bit of Sochi. So the places which, which do develop. But take a look to other parts where people are making teachers 7,000 uh, rubles income, which means 100 euro a month. And of course, the prices are lower. The price average 100, Moscow is 144. So Moscow has about a one and a, one and a half times more expensive local economy. But still, living on 100 euro is impossible. And you see the infrastructure, you see the buildings, you see a lot of things where money could go. But the money doesn't go there. Money did not go into diversification. And the last year, in January 2016, when German Greff, you know, there are two macroeconomists who are worth listening, Greff, who is the CEO of Sperbank, and uh, Kudrin, who was the longest standing finance minister. Greff said at the Gaidar Forum, we must honestly admit that we have lost to our competitors. The era of oil is over, was over, and that in the new technology-driven world, the difference between the leaders and the losers would be larger than during the Industrial Revolution. These are pretty tough words. You don't find the full speech anywhere on the internet. Three days after it was delivered, it disappeared from Greff's website, from the Gaidar Forum's website, from everywhere. Now take a look. A year and a half passed, and last week, on the 5th of July, not even the English translation is available on the president's website, there was a meeting of Zasedania Savieta pa strategiescom razvitiu i prioritetnim projektam meeting of the Council on Strategic Development and Priority Projects. Kudrin and Greff sitting over there. The president held a relatively shallow introductory speech. And at the very end, after a long discussion, he said, those who are late in the competition in all cases quickly find themselves in full dependence the lead of the leaders of the process of technological innovation. So it took a year and a half to understand that Greff is not the enemy of the nation. The only reaction to Greff's speech was very interesting. The vice president of the Duma from the Liberal Democratic Party, Zhirinovsky, said that Greff should resign from all his posts because he's disloyal to the Russian state. So not much is happening in Russia which would make Russia sustainable economically in the long run. Graham is absolutely right. The current leadership is worried about starting any kind of change. There are so many unseen things happening in Russia. The lorry drivers blockading highways, local strikes, the entire Khrushchevka issue, the Khrushchev built uh, five uh, story buildings that they want to demolish in the, in the middle of Moscow. And the problem is not that they want to demolish if they want to give better housing to people. The problem is that it indicates the total distrust of the Russian people in their government. 
because they immediately believed, okay, so we are going to be moved out to the outskirts of Moscow, some uninhabitable place which will be not adequately developed, the infrastructure will not be good, and so on and so forth. So it's not about Khrushchevka. I was living in Bishkek for two years in a Khrushchevka. I survived. I never had to open the window uh, because the wind was always blowing, winter and summer. Uh, but there are so many things that Russia should be doing. Everything is a matter of urgency and is actually losing. And that's the, the real concern for me is not the Russian leadership. I'm not worried how Medvedev will uh, resign in Toscana, uh, in his lovely place that you can see on the Navalny.com website. Uh, but my real worry is about 140 million other Russians who are going to suffer the consequences of mistaken strategic decisions of the current leadership. I think that for you it could be also interesting the idea of Panslavism. So it was idea very popular in the 19th and first half of the 20th century. The idea, the clue of this idea was to unite the Slavic nations under the big brother's wings, the, under, under the, the Russians. This idea was very popular uh, among the Czechs. Uh, as you know, in the 19th century, the present Czech Republic was a part of the Austro-Hungary, and uh, it was also, and this is also an example of how the Russian can influence the different nations and can exploit the differences and and conflicts inside the, inside the different countries. Finally, this idea of Panslavism lose the popularity among the Czechs after 1968, the Warsaw Pact intervention. However, this is, I, I think it could be also interesting a subject for the study for you. Monika Postak, Minister of the Interior. I have a question concerning the active measures of the Russian Federation. I would like you to wander for a moment and think about the immigration crisis. This could be one of the active measures orchestrated by the Russian Federation, and it would end up with the civil war, for instance, in Sweden and in France. What would be the answer for the Eastern European in that kind of event? Thank you. Just for clarity, this was a question about the Syrian refugee crisis and whether this was an active measure that could lead to war? Leave the Syrians alone. It's about the immigration crisis as a whole and uh, problems, with the, um, problems with the civil aspects of, of it in that particular countries, especially Sweden and France. Okay, I, I didn't quite catch all of it, but I'll try to answer what I, I think I understood and will, again, be, be grateful for uh, comments from, from the others. I, I think there is, is reason to think that, um, that Russia did intentionally try to uh, aggravate the, the, the refugee and immigration crisis through its uh, conduct of, of military operations in, in Syria. Uh, apparently, the deliberate uh, targeting of hospitals, schools, uh, civilian population centers, and, and so forth as a way of, of fanning the, the flow of, of refugees into Europe just at the time that it was already uh, reaching kind of a, a political uh, sensitivity in, in Germany and, and other countries. So it, it's, it's my best judgment based on open reporting that that was a, a deliberate part of the, the Russian strategy. Um, whether this could lead to a, to a further es escalation of, of conflict, uh, at least in, in Germany right now where we're living. And, um, you know, Garmisch Partenkirchen itself, uh, a town of about 25,000 people, did get maybe 800 to 1,000 refugees settled there. The, the numbers are going down a bit, a bit now. Um, Germany, I think, feels that at least for the medium term, the refugee crisis is, is under control, that the there's a deal with Turkey to uh, stop the flow through the, the Western Balkans route. Uh, the 
you know, perhaps the, the numbers of people who were going to leave Syria in any case, most of them probably already already have. So there's a, at least a, a pause in the in the immigration crisis. But I think you're right that over the long term, there's the prospect of, of more immigration in general, not just from conflict zones like Syria, but from uh, from poorer regions, neighboring Europe in, in Africa and elsewhere. And that this is a, a long-term conflict, uh, or at least a long-term challenge for, for Europe and the European Union, and, and certainly an issue of, of tension and, and political and diplomatic conflict inside the European Union, uh, especially between countries like Germany and, and the Visegrad states. Um, others like to, to join? Maybe, yeah, so um, as Matt said, if you bomb hospitals, bakeries, and schools, kindergartens, the civil population will move. And that certainly seems to be the case with regards to Aleppo and 70,000 migrants leaving very quickly. And uh, you know, using kinetic force, military force, coercive force, uh, means you can quickly, if you want to, generate large numbers of migrants at particular times. Um, kind of when you use the phrase active measures, I'm thinking more of political assassination Litvinenko, for example, using radium and tea in 2006, or an uh, ex-Duma uh, member in Kiev earlier this year, assassinated on the streets, or Nemtsov, uh, 27th of February 2015, um, in central Moscow. Uh, I, I can kind of consider that more active measures. But the weaponization of migrants of, and refugees, I think, to the extent that Russia does it, I mean, conflicts themselves, uh, generate uh, migrants, which Russia isn't necessarily responsible for, but to the extent that Russia does weaponize migrants, the cases are, I think, using bicycles to cross the Finnish border to send a, a message to uh, Finland. There's allegations that the so-called orthodox oligarch, Konstantin Malofiev, uh, who um, was involved in the financing of the Montenegrin coup 16th of October last year, was also involved in a plan to mass migrants on the Macedonian border and send them across into Macedonia. Uh, so the, the use of migrants, I think, and weaponizing them from the Russian perspective demonstrates the non-viability of regional security systems, of the EU, of NATO. Essentially the message is these institutions are failing, they can't cope uh, um, with this. But also you have internally displaced people from conflicts in Georgia and Ukraine, stresses, you know, Kiev and Tbilisi uh, having to cope with that. It's an additional burden and difficulty. So also looking at IDPs as internally displaced people is, I, I think, part of the, part of the case. Um, yeah, I, I agree with Matt. In, in Germany, at least, the, the feeling is uh, we can cope. Germany's looking at 7 million labor supply shortfall over the next 10 years. Um, and the, the question really now is, can Germany integrate the number of migrants that it has? And you're shaking your head. Um, my wife, for example, uh, who's German, um, had voluntary work with migrants. And there was a Nigerian lady who spoke two or three local languages and English, but had no primary education and hadn't learned to read or write. So first task was to, to teach to read and write and then to learn German as part of the integration process. So for, for some of the migrants, it's a very long process, a very uncertain process whether they'll be able to. But you know, their children uh, will because their children will go through German schooling system and learn, learn German and be much, in a much better position to integrate, I think. Thank you. Uh, very briefly. Uh, and this is going to be the three minutes when I become a Hungarian nationalist, you know, so this is, uh, I hope that you will, you will, you will cope with it. Uh, I think we will have to go back to the starting point. The starting point is that in the last 70 years, ever since World War II, we always saw two things. We saw a small number of people who were eligible to refugee status, the Marlene Dietrichs and the Albert Einsteins. Their integration is not particularly difficult. And we always had economic migrants on masses, and we always picked out the ones that we could do something. 
the integration, the cultural integration of migrants in Europe is generally not fully successful. Whether because we did not do enough, or for other reason, I don't know. You know, the Indians and the Pakistanis are beating up each other in Bradford. Uh, the Vietnamese are, are burning buildings, uh, or the fascists building the Vietnamese buildings in, in Rostock in 1991, and so on and so forth. Plenty of examples. We have to understand that we are coping with a situation which is unprecedented in the last 70 years. That actually millions of people show up on our borders who would be eligible at least temporarily for refugee status. Because what happened to Aleppo and a number of other things. So people are not escaping in order to make 200 euros more. They are escaping because they are threatened in their existence, in physical existence. And then, of course, there is a, a variation how we react to this. Whether we give further encouragement, we have shuffled us, says the Bundeskanzlerin. Or we give some more mixed messages that we are going to take you up temporarily, but you are not going to be welcome. The Willkommenskultur will be missing. You are going to be here, and eventually, when the conflict from which you escaped will come to an end, we will ask you politely to return to your country. And in this situation comes in uh, some countries which are building fences, which is not nice, who are confining people. That's not nice. This goes against humanity. Uh, the entire thing that we are not letting people in is not only violating EU rules, it's violating universal international law. It's violating the 1951 Geneva Convention and its 1967 additional protocol. So we are disrespecting our own humanity. At the same time, I sometimes understand that this kind of migratory pressure should be limited in one way or the other. And where I am critical of the Hungarian government is not necessarily this stopping migration is the way it is stopping and the way it is treating people. So that's, that's where I would, I would make a difference. That's why I call myself a Hungarian nationalist occasionally. So, and at the same time, you know, some countries need labor, but the labor force which is showing up is not necessarily the labor force it needs. Not to mention, inside the European Union, there is a lot of labor movement as well. Two of my three children are living in Germany and Austria, respectively. One studies, the other works, and so on and so forth. So, so there is a structural difference, and that's where I think our agreement is not full with Graham, that the, the difficulty with the integration is very much an issue. And whether Germany will be able to integrate 1.3 million people, I am very, very doubtful. At the same time, if you just look at the election program, the CDU and CSU, and they are certainly going to govern this, that, that country after September 24 as well. They are saying, they just published it last week's Monday, I think, uh, that they want to achieve a zero unemployment policy, it's, which, which is not zero unemployment because there will be people who are looking for jobs. But basically, they want to lastingly have unemployment below 3%. And 1.3 million people on the territory of the Federal Republic is massively interfering with this. So I think we will have to understand that we are facing an unprecedented problem, and we may need a combination of unprecedented solutions. And I agree with those EU leaders that, that are critical about the, the, the Visegrad states government. At the same time, I think that the offer of what the EU is coming up is not a good enough offer. Ladies and gentlemen, we ran out of time a while ago. Uh, I am reliably informed that there is coffee and tea in the lobby, and I am further reliably informed that the staff has not laced those beverages with polonium or anything else, and that it's <laughs> relatively safe to drink. So I would like to invite you all to go out and have something to drink. And if you're interested, come back in 25 minutes for the next panel with three of our speakers and uh, some people from the George C. Marshall Center who will pack the audience and continue what so far has been really a remarkable discussion, very professional, very precise. 
very complicated. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Great, thanks, sir.